morning, everybody. Welcome to the Annenberg Research Seminar. Uh, our session today is sponsored by ARNIC, the uh, Annenberg Network uh, International Communication. And we're delighted to have uh, Ricardo Ramirez here as our guest today. And Molly Bear, who works with uh, ARNIC, is going to, as his faculty host, will introduce him for us today. Welcome. Thank you, Peter. Uh, we're uh, very pleased, uh, both Arnick and ARS, to welcome Ricardo Ramirez here. Uh, Ricardo, as you saw from uh, the paragraph uh, on the web, is a, a freelance researcher, a consultant, and an adjunct professor at the University of Guelph in Ontario, Canada. Uh, he's a leader, a, a leading expert and practitioner in using information and communication technologies uh, for development, in particular in economic and social development in rural communities. Uh, his doctorate from the University of Guelph is in integrated rural studies, and he has earlier degrees in agriculture and in education. He's worked with many NGOs in development in Latin America, uh, and in other countries around the world, uh, as well as with the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization, the uh, International Development Research Center in Canada, and uh, lots of NGOs. Uh, in today's talk, Ricardo will focus on his recently published book, uh, Communication for Another Development, Listening Before Telling, which he co-authored with Wendy Quarry. Uh, this book focuses on how participatory communication practices can be integrated into good development. And in particular, it's a process that uh, uh, the authors say turns decades of communication advocacy on its head. We're all interested in hearing about that. So, on behalf of Arnick and ARS, I'm delighted to have uh, Ricardo back on campus after being here a year and a half ago, and I want to turn the program over to him. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, or good lunchtime. Thanks for coming. Thanks to all the organizers for inviting me here. It's a treat to come, especially this time of year in Canada when it's not so nice. Um, what I want to do is spend about half an hour sharing with you some of the ideas in this book and then asking you to interrupt me around 1.30 if I keep uh, talking so that we have a bit of a discussion. Um, first of all, I wanted to tell you how impressed I am with your facilities. The exhibit the, um, reminded me of a book I saw years ago and then when I read the posters, this running exhibit you have of, of the, um, it's called The Life of Man. Um, has been around for a long time, so you're so lucky to have it here. And the second thing I noticed as I walked in was a quote by Professor Castells about what uh, diplomacy is all about, and it sounded like our book should be about diplomacy. It's about listening. I didn't know diplomacy was about listening, so that was very refreshing. Um, what I want to do is give you a little background on this book, uh, read some bits, the fun bits, um, and then open this up for discussion. Uh, with any luck, instead of looking at your lunch, you already read this long quote, but I wanted to put that there to set the tone. Um, communication is one of those tricky words where everybody looks at it with different eyes. These are the eyes we look at it uh, for this book. And it's certainly not information. So, how did this book come about? came about to an invitation by somebody like many of you, a, a practitioner student who Wendy Corey, my co-author, met and um, who ba basically ended up, ended up looking for a book, a recent book on communication for development. So we got invited to write it. And I want to tell you the story about what made us write it, the style of the book, what we learned, and what it means to us. It is not a how-to book. 
Um, if anything, it's a how to do your work better for ourselves. So we see ourselves as the main audience of the book in many ways because it, this was an exercise in reflection. Um, Wendy and I are practitioners. We make our living doing consulting. Um, in the book, there's a whole section of the book called Working in the Gray Zone. The gray zone is all those situations where we work under conditions that are not very conducive to good, good communication, to participatory communication. So we, we thought it was uh, a, a unique invitation to write this book as an opportunity to go back and be very critical on our own work. The advantage of not being a faculty member anymore is that I didn't mind writing about all my mistakes. Um, I didn't have to write the book to get tenure. It was actually fun to write the book, sometimes. Um, if it wasn't for Skype, we wouldn't have been able to do that because Wendy and I are always on the road. But one of the things we discovered was that we needed to write this book in a style that was accessible. Um, the irony of our field, and we're guilty of doing that ourselves, is we've been advocating for participatory communication in a language that nobody else understands except participatory communicators. And uh, years ago, a colleague of ours at IDRC published a small booklet called Letter to Antophilia. I think if you search it online, you may still get it online. And he said, if I can't explain what ICTs or information communication technology is to my Antophilia, then how am I going to do this? And I discovered, Wendy and I discovered, that writing clearly is very hard. I'm conditioned by academia and by institutions to write in jargon, in, in personal ways. And so we said, no, let's change that. And we came across a book called On Writing Well, um, which has sold very well. You can probably find used copies everywhere um, by William Zinser. And it shows you how to write simply. Take out adjectives. And the fewer adjectives, the more direct the message. So we trained ourselves to write more simply. And I would imagine that there's still more work to be done. But we also decided to make it very personal. So I'll read you some of the personal passages in the book. But it's one of the things we realize is that there are so many cases where we talk about model projects or amazing experiences. And then you meet somebody who worked through that and they said, oh, no, no, you know, that's not like that anymore. So we decided we'd write on the experiences we know. So we cheated a bit because there's a few that we don't know intimately, but most of them we did. So you will find that the book is for a wider audience. Um, my mother read it and understood it, so did my wife. And that's a big accomplishment for communicators because we're not very good at doing that. So I'll share with you bits of that. A woman called Leslie Knott appeared at Z Books in London and said, do you have a book on communication? And they said, no, we don't. Do you know anybody who'd write it? And that's how this whole start, the, the whole effort started. Um, so we start the book with that story. Um, and we laugh at our profession quite a bit. And I'll read you a bit, written a contribution by a friend of ours who's also a practitioner, making fun of why we communicators have been so bad at what we do. And it's a letter written by a fictitious student to a professor. Dear professor, as a student of yours over the past year, I must confess that I am confused. I don't understand what the subject of your course is really all about. You're now talking about social communication. Last week, it was communication for social change. I thought I knew what that was. By the way, which is correct? Is it communication or communications with an S? I'm really perplexed by that one. I read the background literature you gave me, and it refers to development communication. Well, not always. Sometimes it's communication for development. Or when I read that UNDP, the paper called Development Support Communication, I was confused. I thought I had understood that until I read Neil McKee's book about social marketing. Oh, but it's about training, is it? Speaking of training, I understand you're conducting a workshop on participatory communication in June here in Ottawa. Is that the same as social communication? Or is it more like communication for social change? I read the book by Kotler that you recommended. It was about social marketing. I learned that some communication practitioners sell social products and behaviors in many ways, like Madison Avenue. Hey, that's a neat idea. But then I went on to John Hopkins' website and I really got confused. They're talking about infotainment and enter education to control population growth. Boy, I can't wait until I exit education. This is too confusing. I went to the World Bank for enlightenment and found references to BCC, Behavior Change Communication. That has a World Bank ring to it, doesn't it? It reminded me a little of what I saw on CNN recently, 
how the US military used communication to convince Iraqi troops to surrender. But they call that PSYOPs, psychology, psychological operations. By the way, Professor, what is the difference between BCC and IEC? And while you're at it, how do BCC and IEC relate to ICTs? You're perplexed and bewildered student. <laughs> so we've been victims and perpetrators of this situation. And one of the things we found was that we have been pushing for years in international development, especially with the UN, and saying, if you want a good project, you better put a communication <coughs> uh, component. We even wrote manuals on how to do that. And we kept on stumbling with the fact that it wasn't happening. And uh, Wendy prepared a paper for a Congress in Rome called um, Decision Makers Do Want Communication. What they don't want is participation. And we start to realize how often the situation is that decision makers in international development do understand participation, but it gets in the way. It changes the plan. It gets messy. You can't use your log frames or your results-based management. So we've been barking up the wrong tree. We've been saying more communication makes good development. And then we had an aha moment and we said, mm -hmm. it's the other way around. Is when you have good development, it invites communication. And it seems like the magic of international development has started to be eroded by bureaucracy. So here's a passage that we thought was um, an indication of that. It's written by Wendy. My husband, Paul, does not have a bureaucratic bone in his body. A product of the 60s, he moved from Notting Hill in London, selling antiques, to Egypt, drawing on sidewalks, to Morocco, who knows, to Canada, where I tried to get him to think first and learn to plan. In the mid-80s, when we were living in Ghana, the Canadian International Development Agency, CETA, hired him to set up and manage the administrative support unit for the personnel living in Ghana. The work covered just about everything you can think of to look after administrative needs of Canadian pro funded projects in the country. That ranged from handling sea shipments at the harbor in Tema to fixing the plumbing in houses to going to the airport to meet consultants. Just about every evening, Paul would wind up perched on a seat at the bar set up at the Canadian club, his battered briefcase lying on the floor at his feet. Since everybody knew they would find him there, consultants would arrive and ask him for their passports or visas. Paul would dig into his briefcase and hand them out. They grew to expect this. A few years after we left Ghana, I bumped into a consultant who knew Paul in Ghana. He told me everybody missed him. He said that the person who replaced him was in essence a systems man, a person into computers. Consequently, the whole admin support unit was computerized and systems were in place to track passwords, shipments, and so on. A good thing. But the consultant went on, whenever anybody would ask for the new, for ask the new director whether they could find the passwords, he would point to the screen and search the location in another office, still in the police station, wherever, but never there ready on the table for taking. Fast forward 20 years. I'm sitting in a coffee shop in London, having lunch with a friend recently retired from the British, Development Inter British De Department for International Development. He's telling me the story of his arrival in Nigeria, where he said he walked into DFID, their office, to find everybody sitting, staring at their computer screens. And by corollary, not going out to see the country they were in. He says they were disappearing up their own arses on ma matrix management. He told me he immediately turned right around and walked out. He grabbed a car and a driver and drove into the countryside. When they found a few villages, he told the driver to stop. He got out, to the, out of the car, strode into the village to tell a few surprised villagers that he was there to learn. The elders appeared to be honored and organized a mass meeting. Much later, back in the office, somebody took a decision to focus on justice. But, said he, I never found a village interested in that subject. They have their own justice. So, international development has become, in our experience, top-down and driven by decisions made at a distance. So, one of the first things we did in the book is a first section sets the scene. For those of you who don't come from international development, we talk about what communication for development is all about. And then we realized that we had to go back to what was it that made us tick? Why were we so encouraged with this odd field? And we found that in the mid-70s, the Dag Hammarskjöld Foundation in Sweden, which is a think tank in international development, had come up with a policy called Another Development. This is from 1975, and it was the most revealing, sound, solid development policy 
presented at the United Nations in 75 and disregarded. It talked about issues that still are with us today, about ecological development, of locally developed or endogenous development, about working with issues of poverty, about doing it immediately because change is imminent and urgent. And we realized that we don't have to invent a new communication for development theory. We have a communication theory or a development theory that embodies good communication. So we talk about another development and in fact the name of the book is communication for another development. Communication for a development that is more grounded in what people need and know. We then also discovered that there's literature about planning and searching. Uh, in the literature we read, there's a lot of talk about being critical, mainly about what international finance is doing in international development. Planning instead of searching, telling instead of listening. And so one of the things we came up with is, this is one thing that I like to do, is to think in drawings, is this is a summary of a lot of thinking where we realize that very often the international development industry is on the left side, us in left brain. The, the planning is based on a rational, predict predictable, linear way of thinking. Um, it's done through government forms. It's designed for large engineering infrastructure type of activities. In, the, in a communication point of view, it likes to do diffusion. It's message driven. It leans on information. It's top down. It's one way. It's mass media. The communication functions that it leans on are policy communication, public relations, educational communication. It leans on telling. And there's nothing wrong with that if it's for specific projects such as building a bridge. But for social development, for educational development, for changing the fundamental structures, we realized that we needed more of the right brain side, where you do more searching, where you understand the world as systemic, adaptive, and emergent, where you use out new methodologies to complement traditional ones like outcome mapping and most significant change, where you respect small-scale activity, where you work with civil society, where you process is a focus, where horizontal media, two-way communication become the, the driver, and where the communication functions are really more advocacy, participation, and education again, and that's the listening side. And so we ended up, re it's a dichotomy, it's exaggerated if you wish, but not so much if you go to the large institutional situations. Um, any of you from Latin America would know Rius, Eduardo del Rio is a cartoonist in Mexico where I'm from, who's um, a master at communicating complex ideas through cartoons. He's educated Mexico through books like uh, Cuba for Beginners, um, How We're Destroying Our Own Natural Resources Without Foreign Aid, all cartoon books that are used in high schools. And the reason we contacted Rius is that I remember finding a cartoon of his that said that, uh, that showed planners gliding. And in Spanish, planear has two meanings. It's to glide and to plan. So you had these men like these gliding and planning way away from reality, which is what we're finding a lot. So he contributed this beautiful little cartoon to our work. So um, what we did with the book is we have a section called Working in the Gray Zone. As consultants, we're continuously in the gray zone, where somebody calls you up and say, Ricardo, we have a project in West Africa. We need a communication strategy. We only have 30 days to pay you. Can you do it? And there you go and suddenly have this stress of saying, 30 days, I've never been to Ghana, can I? That's the gray zone, and that's the work of practitioners. So we have a section confessing our mistakes working in the gray zone. But then we have several sections that are very encouraging. So we have section, uh, uh, chapter six is on the early champions, and there we tell you the stories of people who've made things happen. And they often do it notwithstanding international development or domestic development. And so we call them champions, very much influenced by uh, other people who've written about champions like um, Glad Gladwell. We tell you the story of uh, Don Snowden, who brought participatory video to the remote parts of Canada. Uh, Gaston Roberge, a, a, a priest in Calcutta that started using photo photography 40 years ago. Um, Alex Sim, who started the radio forum in Canada. Manuel Calvelo Rios, who did participatory video in Latin America. These are champions that made things work, notwithstanding those contradictions. And then in chapter seven, we talk about those who are doing it right now. Uh, the Drishti in, in um, Western India that do participatory video. Um, the Quar Mines who are doing video in Ghana, uh, I'm sorry, 
Community Radio in Ghana, uh, Minou Fuglesang with HIV AIDS in Tanzania, and Brian Beaton with First Nations work in Northern Ontario. These are people who make things happen right now. And what we found was, and here's our framework, is that if you had a champion like that, and these are people that are community development activists, they, they have frere in their genes, they trust people, and they stay in context. We don't, I'm like a butterfly, I keep on moving around. Once I did stay in context for a while, but not long. <coughs> if you have those two things in place, a champion who stays in context, then participatory communication seems to flow in by gravity. And what we've been doing is pushing the methods and being blind to the conditions. And the, and, and the conditions also have to do with what we call the forgotten context, which is the history, the type of institutions, the stress that the society has worked through, the culture, the environment. All of those dictate what kind of communication you can do. So we've been, so we have a whole section on um, understanding context. And we close the book with what we're doing differently for ourselves. Um, we've realized that in our field, and this applies to all of you grad students the day you finish your studies here, and you have a job at a university, with a UN, with USAID, with Oxfam, you name it, is that we realize that the main moment when we can make a difference at the, at the beginning of a new engagement um, has to do with two areas that we can influence. One is training, one is negotiating the gray zone. I'll give you an example, and it's in the book. Um, a friend of ours got an offer to lead a UK NGO in Cambodia. He was going to be the project manager in Cambodia. And he negotiated that for the first year in Cambodia, he would not have a single dollar to spend. So for the one year, Simon is his name, Simon went to meetings with no wallet. And they'd say, who's that guy? Oh, some Brit who's interested in something. So they'd sit and they'd talk about the world as they saw it, the things they were already doing, and the change they needed, and sometimes where they said, you know, we could get a bit of funding there, we could get this thing moving. He listened for a year. At the end of that year, he was bursting to spend money because he knew where it was needed because his communication strategy had been no money. And that's how smart he was, is that he negotiated a listening year. So that's one of the issues that I'm struggling with. And we came up with a set of, we call them touchstones, that we use for ourselves. Um, I am now much more careful as I negotiate new contracts. Very often I lose the contract as a result of that. But what I'm finding is that there's increasingly an openness in international development when you say, I'm not going to bid for that, but I would suggest if you change these and these terms of reference that maybe it's doable. And sometimes it clicks into gear. So you, you reduce your gray zone a little bit. And then we close the book with um, the idea that we really have to emphasize the searching and listening because good communication happens only when you have sound development. The book is not prescriptive, but we do conclude a couple of things. We're convinced that the field needs to be relocated away from the large bureaucracies and onto civil society. And it's already happening. Um, we, are, we are watching a funny irony, which is the units that used to house communication for development in the, in the multilateral and bilateral organizations have either disappeared or become public relations offices. Large bureaucracies have a difficult time keeping participatory approaches alive for very long. They do allow them to happen when you have enlightened leadership, but they don't last very long. And what, what's happening now is we have the privilege of having a few keeners inside those large bureaucracies that are enable. They ena enable champions to work for the long run, but they provide funding with a different set of criteria. It's not a two-year project with a logical framework that has to be finished on the basis of a bunch of indicators. It's something that is much long-term and process-oriented. If you have that, then communication falls in place. And I'll tell you a story. We, um, as part of an evaluation we did for IDRC, which is a Canadian International Development Research Organization in Ottawa, we interviewed some people in Tanzania who had been running a project to do with um, improving health in Tanzania. The managers of the project had no training in communication, but they had a communication common sense. And here's what they did. They stayed in the country for 10 years. They were very good at collecting data. They had all the data ready in their pocket in simplified, well-synthesized visual form. And when there was a policy opening, they would produce a quick and dirty flyer that the minister would get at the right time and change the policy. They changed 
the policies in Tanzania to do with um, malaria medication. And they had no communication training, but yet they were excellent at that. And the reason was that they were champions in context that respected the local culture, that were very good at their job, and they would pick up communication moments like that. So it's made us very different in terms of our approach. We're now realizing that to make communication work, it's less about the methods, and it's more about understanding the context. And my experience right now, collaborating with people like Brian Beaton in Northern Ontario, is that as a researcher consultant, um, it's a pleasure working for them. Because I can be very honest and say to them, I don't know what questions to ask, but maybe we should have a workshop on that. Um, and so one of the challenges with this is it makes you reflect on your position. And that's a very feminist approach, which is locate where you're at. And one of the things Wendy and I have realized is that that's also age dependent. We can now become a lot more critical because we're more established, so we can afford to say, you know what, I'm not going to do that because it doesn't make sense. It's difficult to do that when you're breaking into your career. I want to close now and open this for discussion because if I'm talking about listening, I better listen. But I wanted to acknowledge Wendy Corey uh, and Leslie Knott. Wendy Corey is the co-author of this book and Leslie Knott is the uh, consultant Canadian practitioner who got us going to write this book. So I'll stop there. There's lots I've skipped, but I thought I should give you guys a chance to Tell me where you're at. Questions? Comments? Yes. What, what, excuse me. Why aren't these ideas about listening about all development? Why are they just about communication for development? I mean, isn't this the problem with large numbers of development projects in all their contexts, from, from building the bridge that they're not that people aren't listened to? to uh, why they don't uh, uh, do health behaviors that we think are important? Why is it just a framing that's communication-based when it seems so endemic to the whole field? It's, it is endemic to the whole field. The challenge we have with communication is that, especially in international development, it has become um, synonymous with messages. Okay. And therefore, the listening part is gone. And I'll give you an example. There's we, One of the things I forgot to mention is that we, we've started talking up about projects using orchids as a metaphor. Orchids are beautiful, and they, they, they then wilt and fall off. And when you come back, the plant doesn't look very interesting. But if you're a good gardener and you have the right watering and the right light, they bloom again. International projects are like that. So there's an example of one in Mexico that is very famous. FAO published lots about it called Proderit which was a large drainage and irrigation project. And for a while, they listened actively. They had video training, and, and the staff would go to the field and document what farmers knew about water. So they had an active video listening, and they even produced uh, local development plans on video to show to the engineers in Mexico City. That was the orchid. And then uh, in the 90s, both the World Bank and the government of Mexico decided that no, things should be privatized. And these units that used to listen actively had to now sell services. Mm -hmm. It's expensive to listen. So they, pre they, be they became producers of information. So the institution allowed the listening function for a while, mm -hmm. and then they killed it. Mm -hmm. And so that's what we find with large agencies and government is that the aperture for listening is very short-lived or not there. Mm -hmm. Because if you ask them about something that they and they tell you what you don't want to hear, there goes your bridge or your health program. So it's not conducive to that. So I think the issue is communication has become synonymous with message making. So you rarely get a budget in communication at the pre-proposal phase. But it's also that communication is so segmented. And doesn't this continue that segmentation as opposed to saying it's an integrated part of any development? We certainly, we certainly hope it doesn't, because what we're saying is it's not about communication. It's about good development. Exactly. Yes? Um, I thought it was interesting that you uh, brought up the ideas of another development that have been around since the 70s. And you know, one question that actually I've talked a lot with Joe about is just why, when those ideas are out there and there are models which are potentially better than what we see going on, why are they, you know, what are the kind of institutional inertia that keep those from being enacted. And if you're a practitioner, how do you work either within or around those big institutions which are sort of keeping these perhaps more promising models going? 
Tough question. I, another development stayed in the seat for a while while the Dark Hammer School Foundation pushed for it. Um, Andreas Fuglesang, who was one of my favorite authors in this field, worked very closely with another development. In fact, in the book, we, we suggest that because he worked so closely in the development, uh, another development, that it had a communication gene in it. Um, and, and so that stayed, but it did not fly very long in the large agencies. When I worked with FAO and the UN for about six years, we used that a way of thinking for a while because we had enlightened leadership. But that doesn't survive very long in large agencies. Um, we mentioned in the book the case of UNICEF with, uh, with James Grant. He was a communicator by instinct. He would walk around with an oral rehydration package, and every time he met a minister, he says, for 50 cents, we can save lives. He was a native communicator. But they don't last very long. And I think the issue is that they do last in organizations that have a culture that is open to listening. And large organizations where I do respect the fact that there's spaces when they do that, they don't last very long. So in the end, when we talk about relocating the field, it's not that we're saying that the large institutions should not be involved, but they should be involved in enabling civil society and NGOs, because that's where that attitude takes place. We haven't solved that issue, though. <laughs> Uh, government agencies and other funders are often uh, focused on metrics, metrics, metrics. Now, from your perspective, is that part of the problem, or how do you uh, think about metrics in a listening mode? There's nothing wrong with metrics. It's who owns the question. And so the challenge with the emphasis on metrics is that they often respond to the needs of the funding agency. For bureaucracies, controlling and predicting is very comfortable. And so uh, log frames are fantastic for that. Uh, we quote a friend of ours there saying that we will never get rid of log frames because there's nothing so comfortable for a bureaucrat to have the illusion that he knows what's going on without getting out of the comfort of his office. So there's a whole system that favors that because it's comfortable. But it also looks at aspects of development that are often very short-lived. And so the issue is not whether metrics are wrong. It's that who decides to measure and are other qualities also included. And I think we're starting to sense a shift even in large agencies where they, I'll give you an example, with the work we did in Canada um, in the north funded by our federal government. Uh, one of our students did a, a study where he compared using video-based, most significant change type of evidence with statistical evidence. And then he interviewed senior people in government and said, which of the two would you like to use best? And they said, we want the combination. We like the numbers and we like the, the narrative, we like the video. And he says, and if you had to choose one, they said, if we had to choose one, we choose the video because it's harder to cheat with video than it is with statistics. <laughs> so I have a feeling that there's, in large institutions in government, at least the one I know, our, our, our federal government in Canada, a lot of the international development, there's a, an evidence-based decision-making religion. The whole religion is that if you have evidence, <coughs> it'll inform policy-making. And it's only true to a ex small extent. In the end, it's political. But it's, the idea is to start to show them that, um, and I think ODI with their rapid program that is sort of modeling how decision making is being done, is putting that in its place, is that those numbers in the end don't matter that much. We, I've, we had experiences in Canada with reports of ours that had one set of conclusions and government went exactly the other way around. There's not a lack of evidence, it was that they had a political decision to move on. So I think there's nothing wrong with numbers, it's who owns the decision to use them. <clears throat> I'm intrigued by your notion of context as the central uh, focus of a lot of communications work to, to be effective. Um, and I wonder about, um, in some ways, communications is about extending the context or making a context accessible. And as we're seeing uh, digital media transform a lot of the communications environment, what do you think about the possibility of making context broader, of making the context, text accessible? How do you think about contexts as things that are enlargeable or have some sort of properties in this direction? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, it's a paradox. And on the one hand, you're saying, if the context is not good, should I just sit around and do nothing? Or can I influence the context? And one of the things we do in, in the second last chapter is show how we've been making those decisions. Because you're absolutely right. There's many situations where new media does change the context. It creates more voices. It creates more accountability. But in many other cases, it doesn't. So it's a judgment call that has to be specific to each situation. We're very optimistic, although we're not experts in social media or mobile phones, on the fact that those are changing contexts. There's a, I think it's unprecedented that you have so many people in the world 
I mean, I think it was an issue in The Economist just a month ago saying it's the most transformative international development tool is the cell phone. We have never had a situation where so many people can choose who to talk to, when to talk to, what about, and being illiterate. And so that's changing context for sure. So you put your finger on a paradox, which is in so many cases that is happening. And, but I would argue it's happening so often outside the project culture. And one of the issues is that the project package is so full of contradictions. And one of the contradictions is it ignores context. And so what, what you're emphasizing is particularly true outside the project culture. And I think one of the challenges for all of us is, is there a different way to disburse funds for international development that is not in the project package? And I would imagine new media may one day provide opportunities, but I haven't seen them yet. Great question. Picking up on that and, and, and thinking about the reasons, I completely agree that with the listening and that we can really maximize the, the funds that are already allocated. But now the question I would like to ask the question, so why are the funds that are allocated like they are, the, the official development aid? Um, I also have experienced that um, they did a development, big development project, ICT for development project in Latin America. Uh, we worked on it with the Latin American countries. We thought the project was not good as it was designed. We should change it to ABC, like you said. Went back with it to Europe Aid. Europe Aid said it's a great idea. I mean, the, the economists and everybody understood about development said, okay, yeah, that will really help Latin American countries. However, we will never get it to the European Parliament because that will, make, that will really make Latin America develop. And that will, well, endanger our working places and so forth. And the European Parliament, I mean, the job of the European Parliament who approves these funds is to protect workplaces in Europe. And, so, and actually, they, they cannot approve everything that would endanger the European position <coughs> in the world in really letting Latin America develop. So basically, they told us, well, our people, the, the rich people of the world, you can translate to that, the rich people of the world, they're not going to allocate ODA. They're not going to allocate uh, development aid to things that really make the developing world develop. So isn't the, so? of course, now, if something is developed, I completely agree. We can like fine tune and tweak it a little bit considering that this is not a lot of money to start with, <laughs> ODA, but isn't the real problem rather there that actually starting not without fine tuning and tweaking the little how we go in the village, now looking on the big picture, isn't the problem really that the idea of official development aid is not really dedicated to giving these countries what would really make them boost? Because if we would agree with that, that we really want these countries to develop, we were putting a global token tax on, I don't know, on financial transaction and send a certain percentage of our global uh, of our global money to them as a tax and let them do whatever they want because who knows best is them. And they could then, with all this money we have on a financial token tax given to them, contract the consultants they want, you know, the geniuses they want, and, and, and develop the way they want, even competing with, with mm -hmm. developed countries. So isn't the real problem on this stage? I think you're right on. I don't see where your question is. I think I would agree with most of what you said. The challenge is, what do we do individually? That's the big picture. How do you decide who you work for when you finish here? Are you going to work for the European Union? Are you going to work for uh, uh, Oxfam? Are you going to work for small little projects at the grassroots? Are you going to become a vegetarian? Are you going to run for parliament? These are choices we all make. In the big picture, you're absolutely right. ODA is a small picture in the international finance uh, world. It's got a whole set of basic contradictions, and yet, Governments like yours, like the one I pay my taxes to, make ODA commitments, and that money has to be spent. So you could argue that we're barking up a small tree, but we're hoping that small tree will be less corrupt, a little bit more coherent. Because the big one, I have yet to find a way to influence that. <laughs> so but that will be the main goal, to influence the big one. Well. Uh, can you a lot of reports and inefficiencies and how NGOs are competing to, be, to do the exact same thing. So I was wondering how you think we can change the nature of that to create more cooperation and collaboration amongst these organizations. I don't know if I have a quick answer for that because that's a big challenge. And it happens within NGOs in Canada and it happens with NGOs in developing countries. Um, and I think to a large extent it's Part of the challenge is the conditions under which the aid is dispersed. Um, very often the small ones are not able to compete because the requirements, of, you know, you have to put in a bond or you have to have a certain size of staff and so on. So in the end, it's, it's the default mechanism is competition among a small elite number of them. So I don't have a quick and ready answer to that. I think it's an issue of 
maybe the donor is not understanding the dynamics of what their funding is required and, and, and the impact of that, because I think it, it does create an environment which is not conducive. Yeah, but I don't have a quick, and I wish I had an answer to that one. I, I liked your anecdote about the uh, particular window of opportunity that enabled you know, a certain group of people to present the evidence that was needed and make the policy shift. And I'm wondering um, whether you think, uh, for example, there's a window of opportunity in terms of shifting uh, the paradigm around development to ecologically sustainable development because of the growing sort of public realization and pressure around climate collapse, climate change. And similarly, I'd be interested in what you thought about whether the um, sort of emergence and into greater visibility, because I don't actually think it's really new with the net, but the emergence into greater visibility of social media and the whole social media space, what that means for long-term practitioners of participatory development communication, uh, you know, such as yourself, in terms of I mean, now, that, now that that space has legitimacy because it's a major multi-billion dollar sector and it's transforming the entire media industry space. Um, does that, you know, similarly provide a window for this idea of communication as conversation? Mm. Or how, like, how would you, how do you grab that rather than just say, well, you know, stay off on the margin, saying, well, we've been doing this forever, and that whole social media thing, you know, we know how to do it, but, but remain overlooked. Two tough questions. Let me see if I can answer them, if I understood them. Um, on the first one, on Windows, there's a great paper by a Canadian called. Linguist, and we're referred on the book, but I can send it to you as well. That looks about policy, the impact of policy making when the windows of opportunity open up. Um, on Saturday, we had the 350.org movement around the world. Will that change our prime minister's behavior? I'm not sure. Um, when does that happen? When does a pri when does somebody at that level actually makes that flip? If they have a, a neoliberal strong foundation. It only happens, I think, when they start fearing the election issue. And we're having uh, the chances of having an election in Canada in the next few, well, we have the threat of that all the time because we're in a minority government. But does that, be, does that movement create a window in there? I'm not sure because it also has to combine with a leadership that's enlightened and who, who, who will pick up on that and understand the principles. Um, on the second one, does, is social media creating that? You know, I think it is. And I'll tell you a story that I read in Harvard Business Review. There was a, an article recently about, not recently, a few years ago, about how um, Nike went from being a sponsor of sweatshops and now it's a major advocate against sweatshops. And it had a nice little graph showing that when the idea was marginal, the corporation reacted in a very defensive way. The idea is no longer marginal. It became more mature and now it's uh, mainstream. And at each stage of the game, Nike started changing its behavior to the point that now that it's mainstream, Nike is an advocate for stopping sweatshops. Does that happen with international development and with governments? It has to at some point. I think the fear I have from reading ecological literature is that it may not happen fast enough um, because governments are, our democracies are so short-term uh, oriented. So the question is, will social media create the pressure for a tipping point in time? I think it will. I'm worried it may be a bit late in terms of the ecosystem uh, flipping into a non-reversible challenge or situation. So I didn't answer the question, but I just gave you another way to ask it. <laughs> yeah. One of the things that we're doing in Annenberg is working with the World Bank. There is an interesting, small still movement inside the bank to look at communication in a very integrated way for both for development and for larger um, political action. There's a group called ComGap, uh, Communication for Governance and Accountability uh, Programs. And one of the things that they're trying to accomplish is they're trying to leverage the work of Paul Mitchell's group. He's the head of development communication at the World Bank. And they're trying to say, how would we rethink issues of development, rethink issues of communication, if we started to look at communication not as messaging or not just as something that happens informally like the great communicators that, that you mentioned, and some of those are great examples, but to think about it in a very strategic way and to teach government leaders these communication capabilities, 
to figure out how the current networks that are dysfunctional operate and to figure out what a more robust, sustainable, ethical network would look like. And so it's capturing some of the issues that you're talking about, but in not so much a naturally evolving way, but to listen strategically, to train strategically, and to create a different kind of communication environment. So. Well, if that unit is still operational, that's news, nice news to hear, because I thought it had been dissolved or renamed. Well, uh, it has been renamed okay. ComGap. Uh -huh. The development group is being merged into that group. Okay. Um, that's great. Let's, let's hope it works. I have my doubts. Um, why did it work in Mexico during the 80s with Prodelit? It was World Bank. It was FAO. It was the government of Mexico. There were people at the top in the government of Mexico who, had, who were technocrats but had a deep social understanding. And that combination of the champions that FAO brought together who had an interesting background of having worked with Sencida in Peru and with Allende in Chile, that combination of people, and I interviewed them about this to get a sense of what made the magic work. It was a combination of champions that, brought, brought it come, that came from FAO, the World Bank interested in that, and leadership in Mexico that had it in their genes. If you don't have that, you can't train all dogs to have new tricks. And so one of our experiences, and we have a couple of frustrating experiences that we've lived through, formulating communication components for international finance organizations like the bank and EFA, is that there is not enough of those enlightened leaderships at the top who will let that happen. And that as soon as the budget has to be reduced, communications out the door or it becomes information and public relations. So I think, I think it's worthwhile. I think the challenge is, can you find champions in government who are sensitive to that? Because I, I think it really comes from having a background and an approach that is conducive to that. I don't think the bank on its own will be able to influence that unless they're very choosy of key people in positions like government of power who would be sensitive to that. And then how long are they there? So those are honorable challenges or approaches, but one of the frustrations we have found is that communication units in agencies <coughs> like the bank, in FAO where I was, disappear very quickly. Um, we had a World Congress, we mentioned in the book, the World Congress of uh, Communication for Development in 2006, hosted by the Communication Initiative, the World Bank, and FAO. First time we had communication for development on, on the map with 900 participants. Um, FAO closed its unit months after. And so organizations are not very good at keeping communication in the listening mode going for very long. So I'm interested to hear that you're doing that. And I know Paul Mitchell in that group, so keep me posted. I'll be interested to see how that goes. Yes. Um, first of all, very interested in the information you presented. And thank you for coming. Um, I'm not sure if these are questions or just sort of responses, but one of the things that I heard was you're talking about listening, but there were several instances of slipping back into ocular-centric tropes. You talked about apertures and windows. And I know that this was a study of pragmatic applications in the narrow context, but there's a broader theoretical conversation that's going on from Martin Jay to Jonathan Stern on the metaphysical level. Um, People like Chris or Ratcliffe have studied listening as a way to teach communication competency in the classroom. Um, Nick Coultry and Amit Pinchevsky have debated the utility of listening for doing media criticism. And it seems like all of those things are so intertwined with development projects because it's a global media environment, so mass media affects it. Listening has to be a commitment that recognizes a balance between listening and looking, not listening as a different approach to doing looking. And so it seems like here you have specific insights that could enrich that theoretical conversation, as well as draw insights from them, <laughs> if it wasn't sealed off from the academic jargon that you said at the outset you were trying to get away from. Uh, you're way ahead of me on the theoretical side because I don't know that literature. Um, we're working more with things we have struggled in and uh, contributed to some damage and some good. 
So it's very pragmatic and practical based. I, I hear you. I think the, 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 the challenge we have is that we're emphasizing the listening on purpose, not, not proposing that that's the only function that you need, but realizing that that's the one that keeps on getting lost. And so in that sense, that dialogue is important. But our bias is certainly to push that because that's the one that seems to get lost. But I'd be interested in hearing more about the theoretical aspect because I'm not up to speed with that. Sure. Okay. Happy to share this. Yeah. Other observations or questions? Charlotte, do you want to say something about the book and how it? Uh, uh, yes, the book that, um, that uh, Dr. Ramirez was talking about today is available. Um, it should be available in the bookstore soon. His publisher is working with our bookstore to get it here. But in the meantime, we have a very few number of copies um, with, with Dr. Ramirez today, which are on sale for the reduced rate of $20. So if you are <laughs> interested, come see me. But there are only a few that will be just first come, first serve. Auction <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to let you guys small me and you know, if I survive, I'll sell them. Well, thank you very much, uh, Ricardo. Thank you. Thank you.